Good evening, everybody. Um, I hope everyone's doing well. Had a nice day. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Michael Bublik, and I'm a board-certified uh, ENT physician and uh, facial plastic surgeon. And uh, today I'm going to be talking about things that affect a lot of patients, um, allergies, sinus disease, and um, new and innovative approaches to um, sinus disease and allergies, including um, minimally invasive sinus surgery. So I have no disclosures and no financial disclosures to report um, on any of the th stuff I talk about. So the objectives of today's talk is to um, review the prevalence of chronic rhinosinusitis or sinus disease, describe the symptoms, uh, and then describe the symptoms of allergies or allergic rhinitis, and discuss the interaction between the two, and then discuss treatment options. So when we talk about sinus disease and allergies, the new approach is to talk about it as a unified airway from the nose down to the lungs. There's been many links between asthma, allergies, and sinus disease. And many reports have shown that when we uh, treat the allergies and the sinus disease, the asthma gets better. So this is the common unified airway from the nose down to the lungs. And allergic rhinitis, which is allergies, affects about 15 to 40 percent of a population. Asthma is in about 7 percent of the population. And 20 to 40 percent of patients with allergic rhinitis, or AR, the abbreviation, have asthma. So treatment of allergic rhinitis and sinusitis improves asthma, as we, we've discovered you know, in the unified airway approach. So it's all kind of related. So, People have allergies, they'll have worsening asthma symptoms, they'll have uh, sinus disease, they'll have allergies. So people that have been treated for their allergic rhinitis and sinus disease have better lung function. And then what do you think happens with sleep and allergies? So these allergies cause us all this inflammation in the nose, and that causes people difficulty breathing, especially at night, as you accumulate all the allergens throughout the day. So you get this mechanical obstruction of the airway leading to increased nasal airway resistance. In other words, air can't get in through the nose. People can't breathe that night. They have more awakenings and arousals. And they have increased sleep apnea because of these types of symptoms and obstruction. And the treatment strategies that we're going to talk about are to reduce this physical obstruction and reduce the sleep apnea, which has been found to be increased during allergy season. So chronic sinus disease, how many people here suffer from chronic sinus disease or have had it in the past? So a good number. So what causes chronic sinus disease? So inflammation of the sinus lining caused by bacteria, viruses, and allergies. Structural issues, a deviated septum can cause a blockage of the sinus opening. What are some common symptoms? Nasal congestion, facial discomfort, nasal discharge, headaches and fatigue. And then we stratify sinus disease being between acute, which is, you know, acute cold, acute infection, less than four weeks, and a chronic. So people that suffer from chronic sinus disease greater than three months or have had recurrent sinus disease. So chronic sinusitis, chronic sinusitis essentially impacts patients' quality of life. Um, more than diabetes or congestive heart failure. And the prevalence is high, estimated about 37 million in the United States. And that poses a big economic burden because patients have to take medication, prescription medication, and over-the-counter medications. I'm not going to go through all this, but this is the algorithm that we use when we see a patient with sinus disease and allergies. As we see here, allergies or allergic rhinitis contributes to sinus disease, and they interact. And then also, when we evaluate patients, we want to see what else is going on within their nose. So NP and without NP is nasal polyps. So any type of tumors or masses, we always want to see um, on examination whether or not they have that. Other things that can contribute to sinus disease, reflux. So if you have bad acid reflux, it's thought that it could uh, aspirate that up into your nose, cause nasal inflammation, and that'll cause more sinus disease. Some patients are allergic to aspirin, and so when they're allergic to aspirin, they take aspirin, they get more polyps and more nasal congestion. 
So just a quick little pause and a review of what we talked about. So allergies and allergic rhinitis can contribute to nasal obstruction through inflammation. Sinus disease can contribute to nasal obstruction through the same mechanism. Allergies and chronic disease can cause sleep apnea or snoring, sinus symptoms, worsening asthma, and overall poor quality of life. How many people here have been affected by sinus disease and, and, and has it worsened your quality of life? So other factors that we always want to consider with uh, rhinitis and nasal obstruction and sinus disease is mechanical factors. So is, does the patient have a deviated septum that's blocking one side of the nose that's causing the patient not to breathe? Adenoids, which are usually present only in kids, are they present in the adult? A foreign body, which we usually see in kids, they'll stick like a bead or something up their nose and they'll have sinus or pus or drainage from their nose. Tumors, we always want to make sure there's no tumors in the nose. Acid reflux, as we talked about, and infections, which is the major cause of sinus disease, be it viral, bacterial, or fungal. So what are some allergic symptoms? So we talked about sinus, and now we're going to talk a little about allergies. So patients have seasonal symptoms, which are like springtime, and year-round symptoms, or perennial, if uh, you've heard of them. They can be trees, weeds, mold, grasses, cockroaches. There's all kinds of things that people can be allergic to. Those are airborne allergens. There's also food allergens that people are, can be allergic to. And they can combine to give you even a more severe allergic reaction. Po they can cause post-nasal drip, nasal congestion, sneezing, itchy eyes, runny nose, skin symptoms like dermatitis and eczema, eustachian tube dysfunction, which is that chronic feeling of fullness in your ears, and mouth breathing, because you're just constantly congested. These are just some pictures of patients with allergic disease. As you can see, their eye, this is an eye here, and it's just very irritated, and all the blood vessels are swollen. This eye as well, very swollen, just all the stuff that the patient's exposed to. The eyes are exposed, and the nose is exposed, so they get a reaction. This is a child with something called allergic shiners. I'm sure people have kids and grandkids. And this is a pretty severe uh, reaction, but this is a typical reaction in a child with severe allergies. So where do we start when we see a patient with allergies and sinus disease? First and foremost, we want to take a detailed patient history. Uh, every case is unique in its own aspect. I mean, there's a lot of overlap, but you never want to um, discount uh, patient symptoms. Following that, we do a comprehensive physical examination and a fiber optic examination, which is a little tiny camera placed in the nose to look for polyps, um, tumors, and other types of lesions and deviated septums that can cause obstruction and symptoms. So once we have a diagnosis, sinus disease or allergies, so allergies what we do, we do skin testing for both airborne and food allergies as we discussed, and for sinus disease, we have to determine whether it's an acute infection or a chronic infection. And then there's medical management, antibiotics, over-the-counter medications, nasal steroids, and surgical treatment. We also want to obtain a CT scan in patients with recurrent sinus disease to see what else is going on within the sinuses. Speaking of CT scans, so some of you, how many people have had CT scans for sinus disease? So quite a few. So, it's the single best imaging technique for paranasal sinus disease or sinus disease. So we often order that. We look for mucosal thickening or air fluid levels in the sinuses, meaning there's fluid and infection just built up that can't drain. It's used for preoperative evaluation before any type of surgery is performed. So just quickly looking at the sinuses, this is um, your sinuses, your eyes here. Above your eyes are your frontal sinuses. Between your eyes are something called the ethmoid sinuses. In the back of your nose is something called the sphenoid sinus. And the ones below your eyes here are called the maxillary sinuses. So any of these sinuses can be affected. And the reason we get a CT scan is to determine which sinuses are affected by sinus disease. So we can target the therapy and the treatment. So this is a typical CT scan of a patient with uh, sinus, some minimal sinus disease. And here's your maxillary sinuses. Here's your uh, ethmoid sinuses we talked about. 
The black is good, so you want to see black. That means there's air going through the sinuses, it's healthy, you're able to aerate and um, breathe well and not have pressure. When we start to see fluid in here, the same color as the eye here or the brain here, then we start to worry. So here's a typical patient. Um, this is a CT scan and this is the fiber optic examination and we talked about where a little camera is inserted through the nose. And this is a polyp. So this patient has polypoid disease. That's probably giving them sinus infections and obstruction and pressure and drainage. Here's a CT scan of that patient. Remember we saw all that nice black aerated area? Well this patient doesn't have it. It's all filled in with disease. The other um, thing that can cause um, you know, nasal obstruction symptoms is a septal deviation. So this is looking from the bottom of the nose and this is the septum going all the way into the right side of the nose. It's supposed to be all black here. And then we see that same septum going all the way towards the right side. Okay? It's supposed to be nice and black here, but there's no airway here, so this patient can't breathe. So what are the approaches to treating chronic rhinosinusitis? So patients have options, obviously, medical therapy, surgery, or no therapy at all. I just want to pause for a few questions if anybody has any. Go ahead. How does um, aspirin cause polyps? Well, patients, there's something called Samter's triad, and those are patients, it's a fancy term, but they have polyps, they have asthma, and they have a reactivity to aspirin. So when they're exposed to aspirin, they get worsening of their asthma symptoms and their polyps grow. They have a hypersensitivity to aspirin. Aggravation, yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Well, I have a case where uh, when I go outside early in the morning, it's pretty nippy out there, and I'm fine until I get in the house again. But it's faint and intense. It seems to activate whatever the nasal congestion is. And then uh, uh, I am a, a good uh, buyer of the Kleenex. Yeah. Um, so that's rhinorrhea or nasal dripping with you know temperature changes, and that's um, more of an autonomic or nervous response, nervous system response. So there's medications that we use for that. I mean, you can also have allergies. You can be responding to something in the environment, um, but there's anticholinergics or nasal atrovent. Those kind of medications do help for that. So you usually use it about half an hour before you go outside, or some people use it for alcohol. So they they'll drink wine and they'll get a lot of nasal stuffiness. It's the same kind of causal effect. Okay, so the first thing we always treat, we never rush into surgery with any patient. Um, and we always want to use medical therapy as our first line. So medications that treat sinusitis include antibiotics. How many people have been on antibiotics for sinus disease? Yeah. Myself. Uh, nasal steroid sprays. Uh, a lot of people have used those, I'm sure. Um, and they're effective at reducing mucosal swelling and relieving sinus obstructions. They do have limitations, though. 20 to 25 percent of patients may not respond or relapse after one or two intensive cycles. And there's also the question of which antibiotics to use. Some, sometimes the not, uh, an antibiotic that's not strong enough is used for a severe acute infection, and then the patient lingers for a long time. Um, it's expensive. Antibiotics are expensive. Patients don't like to take medications. And there's side effects, you know, of antibiotics, which I'm sure everyone has had. So surgical techniques. So patients are often scared to have surgery for sinus disease. Um, but things have changed in the field of uh, ENT and sinus disease. Sinus surgery has evolved. It's become a more or a less invasive approach, less invasive surgical technique. Elimination of open surgery, there's no cuts on the outside of the nose, there's no cuts on the inside of the mouth. Um, for the most part, I don't do it anymore. Uh, and we have endoscopic tools, so we look through cameras at the sinuses that are blown up on big screens, so we have everything magnified and everything visualized. This is a typical endoscope that we use, and that's inserted in the nose along with the instruments that we use um, in order to clear sinus disease. 
We also use image guidance. So as we know, you know, there's vital structures close to the sinuses. And we always, in complicated sinus disease, we use image guidance so we know where those vital structures are at all times. So this is typically how we look through the nose um, in the clinic when you see you know, the physician. And he looks with a camera that's either rigid like this or a little flexible one. And we look at within the sinuses to see if there's any polyps or any disease. This is the same way the surgery is done as well. So this is how surgery was done before. Everything was removed. And patients had a larger recovery time. It was a little more invasive. You know, they couldn't go back to work I mean, you know, within two or three days. So this type of surgery is reserved for patients who have had severe disease, have had multiple sinus surgeries, and just have disease that can't be treated otherwise. So this is now reserved for very severe, severe cases, which I rarely see, and not for the cases that are, you know, normal sinus disease. So the advancements in endoscopic devices continue. So now, as how many people have heard of a balloon dilation of coronary vessels? So this is similar to balloon dilation of coronary vessels. Before the technique was to, or the theory was to remove everything in the sinuses, clear everything out. But the pendulum has swung towards a minimally invasive approach, meaning we want to just restore the normal anatomy, allowing those sinuses to drain, allowing you to breathe better, allowing you to recirculate air better. The instruments are flexible, they're done endoscopically, and the, and the uh, balloon sinuplasty is a catheter based, so it's minimally invasive, less trauma. It's designed to navigate through torturous sinus anatomy, and it can be used with other medical therapies, or FES, which is functional endoscopic sin sinus surgery techniques. So before I go into how we do the balloon sinuplasty procedure, are there any questions I can answer? What was FES again? That's functional endoscopic sinus surgery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, know, uh, I don't know, about 15 or years ago, I had a, a doctor that um, tried to do a, a early type of balloon stuff online. It was just basically a long, skinny balloon that he stuck up there and pumped it up with air, and it was very painful. And didn't do much good. Is this new thing different than that somehow? Well, how long ago was that? Probably 10 years ago. Or yeah, so. it's different. Yeah, this one, I've been using this system for about six years and it's evolved a lot since then. So, yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, so the patency in long-term studies have been over 90 to 95%, so just as efficient as traditional sinus surgery. So they don't go back and have to have it redone? Not usually. I mean, there's always a possibility that can need to be done, but long-term, yeah. yeah. So how's it done? So as we talk about, this is a frontal sinus right above your eyes. And this is the opening to that frontal sinus. So when it's closed off as it is here, you can't drain the contents from that sinus. So you'll have pressure over your head, you'll have headaches, fatigue, you know, just chronic sinus symptoms. What the balloon does through endoscopic instruments, those little en endoscopes that we, um, this is an endoscopic view. We insert the balloon and there's a guide catheter with a very bright light on it. The bright light is seen through the forehead to confirm where we are in the sinus. The balloon is then dilated to naturally open and outfracture some of those tiny little bony pieces so that the sinus can drain. And here's a view through the endoscope, and here's a view through the endoscope again. And as we can see, there's no trauma, there's no bleeding. Then the, the balloon is deflated no stent is placed, and the device is removed. And as we can see, the opening of the sinus is preserved. Well, this is a diagram, but here we can see the opening of the sinus preserved, and a post-op CT scan showing aeration or 
nice drainage of the sinus. This is the catheter, and as we can see, it's transilluminated right through the forehead. So we can see exactly where our placement of the catheter is. Any questions? Is this person under some sort of anesthesia? Yeah, so this is done under either general anesthesia and some patients even tolerate it in office. Wow. Yeah, so you go home, you go back to work the same day. Uh-huh. Just displaced, yeah, okay. yeah. Which is what we would, no, that's what we would do with traditional sinus surgery, except we'd remove all that bone and normal tissue, which now we've found that we have to preserve that in order for the body to function and for the sinuses to drain appropriately. Mm -hmm. How long would that procedure last before it needs to be done again? Open it up. Most of the time it doesn't have to be done again. In that last example where you showed the opening of the sinus cavity, whatever, um, there still looked like there was a lot of you know, inflammation. And, you know, mm -hmm. and does that have to drain out? That's going to all drain out. So now we opened the drainage pathway before it wasn't open. So anytime you'd have any type of fluid or a viral infection or a bacterial infection, it wouldn't drain. It would just stay there. So you get constant headaches, eye pain. But now, you're still going to get colds. You're still going to get infected because we all get colds and we all get viral infections. But now, the virus can, and all the flu can drain out. It doesn't sit in there and it doesn't accumulate a bacterial infection. So is there follow-up um, anti antibiotic treatment to assist with that post-surgery? Not, not, unless I see a lot of material that looks like you know, infected, infected, then I will put them on, which most of the time I do. I will actually irrigate the sinus which means put a lot of water in there and drain out all the bad material. And if it does look infected, I will put them on antibiotics afterwards. How come the next time you get a cold or allergy season hits, your sinus doesn't all start looking like all puffy again? It can. It can. And then can you go on antibiotics, but you'll still have drainage? Exactly. Yeah. Um, Well, there's, um, you know, there's severe complications. The brain and the eye are close. So if you have infections that linger for a long time, you can get eye swelling, spread of the infection to your eye. If you have any part of the skull base, which is the border of the brain to the sinuses, that can spread intracranially as well. Um, so those are severe complications of sinus disease. And I've seen them all. Huh? They're rare, but I've seen quite a few. Yeah, yeah. and blindness as well. I think they're good. I mean, I, I don't like people to use them every day, but I like to, people use them when they have infections because you don't need so much irrigation on a daily basis. And they can get into your ears if you irrigate too much. I'm sure people have felt that before if they've used it. Um, so if you have an infection, it's good. If you don't have one, there's no reason to use it. Oh, the fungus in the, in the sinuses? So there's something called allergic fungal sinusitis, and that's, you get a little fungus in there, but it's more of an allergic reaction. So people that have lots of allergies will get a reaction in their sinuses and cluster off some fungus in it. So it's, a, it's, it's a, kind of like a fungal reaction. It has fungal elements in it, but it's more of an allergic reaction. And then you also have invasive fungal disease, like diabetics, and people that are immunocompromised that have you know, HIV and very bad diseases that have you know, lupus that are just, just are on cancer treatment, they can get fungus in their nose, and that can be pretty aggressive. So that's why we always take a look with a camera at everybody, make sure they don't have that if they are immunocompromised or have other diseases. Mm -hmm. I think they're good medications. As long as you take them about 30 minutes before you go outside. 30 minutes prior to uh, going outside. Yeah. Is it OK to do sinus lavage more frequently during like a seasonal hour, during hay fever season? Yeah, I mean, some of the theories are that you're washing out some of the allergens outside out of your nose. Yeah. 
Oh, okay. I'll repeat him then. Okay. Thanks. Okay. I don't remember all of them already, so. <laughs> So the question is, does sinus infections affect the hearing? So the eustachian tube, which drains the ear, is continuous with the sinus mucosa and nasal mucosa. So if that's infected and inflamed, then your ear can drain through the eustachian tube as well as it should. And then yes, you'll have ear fullness and maybe some hearing loss because of that, yes. You're right, the maxillary, uh-huh. The maxillary sinus. Like, is it bad? Like, um, you shouldn't have that surgery if you have a sinus infection. Can you talk a little bit about, like, like if you have pain, can a sinus infection cause pain here in your teeth? Or, or like, if you're, are those problems related? So the question is, can you have um, teeth pain from sinus infections, and yes, you can. That's one of the symptoms, actually. If you have bad maxillary sinus disease, which is the sinuses below your eyes, you can have pain that's referred into your teeth. Yes? And you shouldn't have sinus surgery. I mean, you shouldn't have that implant that will expel an infection from the sinus. Probably not. Probably you have to clear one before you can get Yeah, I get a lot of referral from dentists that are okay. going to put implants because they usually do some type of x-ray. If there's fluid in there, they send the patient to me. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think your question is, can teeth disease cause sinus disease? And the question is yes. So if one of your uh, or teeth or odontogenic infections can lead to sinus infections, especially if the root is high enough, because there's not much room between the roots of your teeth and the, and the opening of the maxillary sinus or the sinus below your eyes. So yes, they can definitely cause that. Mm -hmm. Yes? So your question is, can so you have more allergies with your CPAP machine? Well, just more nasal congestion, which I, I don't know if it's from, from uh, allergies or not, but I'm just less comfortable. Like, I can yeah. breathe through the night. That's the plus, but the nasal worsening. Do you have a humidifier with your CPAP machine? Mm -hmm. It's probably from nasal dryness. Um, you're still probably getting a little bit of dryness. Um, it shouldn't affect too much else. So, but if you do get dry in your nose, you can have symptoms like you can't, it's difficulty breathing. Mm -hmm. Yes? Can a sinus infection cause a really bad cough without any other uh, side effects or uh, temp, uh, elevated temperature? Mm -hmm. So the question is, can a sinus infection lead to cough? And yes, there's something called post nasal drip that I briefly talked about at the beginning. So. If you have dripping of sinus contents or pus or any type of secretions into the back of your throat, there's not much room between that and where your voice box is, which will make you cough. So yes, that can cause that. Yes? And what do you do for that? Um, over, there's, you, know, you can try Claritin over-the-counter medications if it's from allergies. Um, nasal steroids help with that just to decrease the inflammation and secretion of nasal mucosa. And then also other medications like uh, for weather changes and um, allergies to wine, things like that. Mm -hmm. Yes? So the question is, is there a contraindication to take Flonase for a long period of time? Not that I know of. There's some contraindication if you have certain medical conditions, but no, asthma is not one of them. 
Okay. So the other um, piece of technology that we've started using that has enhanced um, the um, sinus surgery and minimally invasive sinus surgery, which we have here at Verdugo Hills Hospital, it's the only hospital that has the combination of the balloon sinuplasty and the um, new advanced uh, endoscope, which is the Cyclops. Um, essentially, this new instrument, we are able to visualize sinuses um, deeper and in other angles that we weren't able to do before without opening the sinus very widely. So it improves visualization of pathology for better outcomes. So this is just, it's hard to see what this is, but this is the maxillary sinus below the eyes. And we were able to, with a cyclops scope, see this fungal disease. Remember we were talking about fungal disease? Sorry, fungal disease a little earlier. And this, with this minimally invasive approach, sorry, it keeps doing that. We could, without opening the sinus too widely, we're able to look inside, see that we have a lot more disease in there, and start to clean that out. So what's our after-procedure maintenance after balloon sinuplasty or any type of sinus uh, surgery? Often requires management of allergies with allergy testing and treatment. Since allergies, as we know, can cause sinus disease, aggravate sinus disease, and uh, cause return of nasal symptoms. Saline irrigations, which we talked about, for an acute infection or post-operatively. Steroids and nasal steroids. And the topical anticholinergics for uh, reactions to wine and things like that, a lot of rhinorrhea or nasal drippage. So in summary, chronic rhinosinusitis or chronic sinusitis, allergies and allergic rhinitis can all be connected. It's important to get an accurate diagnosis with a comprehensive physical examination and allergy workup. And if surgery is indicated, it can now be done minimally invasive and with a quick recovery. Thank you for your time. So temporary allergy relief besides nasal steroids, sprayed uh, nasal steroids. Is, is there a restriction on that also because of high, uh, high blood pressure? I don't, I give it typically to patients with, high, or I, ha, I, I, I have no problem giving it to patients with high blood pressure. That's the prescription item. Yeah. With glaucoma, I will be careful though, if they have glaucoma. Uh, the question is, do I pack noses and do we pack, or nasal, is, is nasal packing placed within the nose after the surgery? I don't use nasal packing after my sinus surgery, so, so no. there's no second surgery? No, none at all. Yes? Unless you also have to correct for a deviated septum. So if we do have to correct for a deviated septum, it's done at the same time, through the same type of instruments, no cuts on the outside of the nose, and we remove the parts of the septum that are deviated and preserve the rest. So you can breathe better. What about um, uh, chronic use of things like oxybutazolin and rhinocort? Does that have to be stopped before the surgery, or uh, is that something that can be managed after the surgery? Well, chronic use of afrin or oxymetazolin is a question uh, is not good because you get addicted to that type of medication. And then once you come off it, you get rebound congestion. It's hard for people to come off of that. So I don't recommend afrin or oxymetazolin for longer than two or three days. Um, in terms of nasal cord, really no restrictions. You could use that right before surgery. And I often pay, place it, give it to patients after surgery because they have allergies that cause more symptoms so they're controlled with the rhinocord or the nasonex or the flow nasal. Is afrin a steroid? No, it's a decongestant. It's a topical decongestant. Mm -hmm. On the deviated septum, then, uh, if you remove that, that's more surgical, so that would require some sort of packing or something like that? No, I don't pack for septums. Oh, really? No. Oh. 
The other part of the airway that we I didn't mention, but is the turbinates, which are on the sides of the nose, and they're really res or inside on the sides. They're really responsive to allergies, and they swell, and they have bony swelling as well. So those I will reduce as well, uh, all endoscopically without any packing during the surgery if that's a problem for the patient. But that's essentially like cutting, not just ballooning. That's a little bit, but it's yeah, it's a little bit more cutting, but. It's all inside the nose. Most patients recover within a couple days. Yes? Um, for the balloon, um, what kind of fashion is If it's, if, I know it's done in the sinuses, but will it clear up the accumulation of the mucus in the throat also? I know it's, um, I, I guess, connected, you know, with yeah. the EMT. So the question is, for patients that have cough or throat irritation, if it is only due to sinus disease, how, how many patients will benefit or have a reduction or elimination of those type of symptoms with the balloon sinuplasty? It's hard to know because there's other factors that contribute to that, like reflux, but the post-nasal drip from the sinus infections that patients have will be definitely improved. And most patients are improved to the point where they no longer have symptoms that are as bothersome as before or bothersome at all. Yeah. Do you do the surgery here at Ruby Hills? Yes. Do you do it elsewhere? Uh, not with this technology. With the Cyclops, I only do it here. That's right. You said this was yeah. the only Yeah, with the Cyclops and with the balloon. Other, uh -huh. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. They're all outpatient surgeries. But it's still here. It's still here, yeah. So you're never really admitted. All patients go home the same day. I mean, unless there's a complication, but I've never had one, knock on wood. And, <laughs> but, <coughs> yes? Go ahead. We'll do both. Come on in. <laughs> um, I have to evaluate how what are your al actual allergy symptoms. Take a look in your nose. What are your sinus symptoms? If you have no allergies, we won't test you for allergies. But if you do, we'll test you for allergies either before the surgery, if you do need surgery, or afterwards. So it doesn't matter when, but as long as you're tested at some point within a period of you know a couple of weeks to a month around the surgery. The surgery? How much does the surgery cost? It's covered by your insurance. Is it covered by Medicare? Yes, it's covered by Medicare, the question. Any insurance? Yes. Sinus surgery is covered by all insurance as long as it's medically indicated, and we don't do it if it's not. So. What about if somebody doesn't have insurance? We can figure that out, yeah. The question is, if someone doesn't have insur insurance, how do they pay for the surgery? And there's a way to do that. There was a question about a new word for me, rhinorrhea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that that can occur because of temperature changes, you know, in and out of air conditioning and so on. And mm -hmm. you said that that can be treated um, kind of acutely. I don't remember how. how. There's topical nasal sprays similar to Flonase and Nasonex that can treat those mm -hmm. if that is the cause. Those are called like nasal atrovent. It's prescription also. Yeah, it's prescription. Thank you. You're welcome. For just, do we need the balloon just for post-nasal drip? No, the balloon is for sinus disease. The post-nasal drip could be a reaction to allergies. So the mucosa within the nose or tissue within the nose is just secreting so much stuff that you can't take it all out out of the front of your nose, so it's dripping in the back. So for those cases, you know, we have to see if there's a septal deviation causing the dripping to go from the back of the nose instead of the front, or if the turbinates are too big. 
Usually we start on a nasal steroid initially. And that helps patients. Yes? Is Sudafed used um, only for short-term therapy or is it used as a continuous therapy for um, uh, sinus pain? Uh, Sudafed is a temporary treatment, just like Afrin or oxymetazolone. It's addictive, right? Um, it's, Afrin's more addictive, but... Sudafed, it can. Afrin has a lot more, though. Yeah. Yes? You're welcome. Thanks for having me.